You are entering the bonus stage, a podcast produced in association with OceanOfBees.com, with your host Marauder and Phoenix Nine Two Three, a podcast for all gamers, console and PC alike. Welcome to Bonus Stage. Hello and welcome to Bonus Stage, a podcast produced in association with OceanOfBees.com. As always, I'm your host Marauder, and I'm Phoenix Nine Two Three. We have this intro down to a science. Finally. No, yeah. Not a single thing could go wrong. <laughs> Welcome to episode 24. We are recording this on August 29th, uh, 2013. And as always, we are going to start out by looking at what's new on OceanToBeast.com so that we can jump into uh, two things that I want to talk about uh, that are in the news right now. So heading over to wow, Ocean we of Bees. Actually have something to talk about. I know. <laughs> there's actual topics on this podcast. It's like, it's literally like we're trying. But you know, failing miserably. Doing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Um. All right. So, looking over at oceanbees.com, we have a handful of new videos. So I'll just stop. Start from the bottom up. Uh, the first one is J- Jenkins plays Surgeon Simulator 2013 Team Fortress 2 Edition. Uh, it's another one of his let's plays where the inspector's butler. Uh, gives a hand at Surgeon Simulator. Uh, 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 get it? Uh, 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 clever. Yes, very much. Uh, so if you guys are interested in, the, in that whole series, check it out. They are always hilarious. Uh, next one up, we have four videos from Sammy J. Reeds. So I'll just go through them one at a time here. We've got uh, her review of the book Ender's Game, uh, A Song of Ice and Fire, A Game of Thrones, uh, Magician Apprentice, Perfect Shadow, and that's it. So all those four videos of those four uh, books. If you're interested in any of those, check them out. I find her reviews to be very informative, but also very fun at the same time. Not too, uh, not too in depth. Mm-hmm. Like she's trying to talk. Like the way she discusses it, it doesn't seem like she's trying to talk over you. It's very to the point. Yeah, yeah. It's very to the point, doesn't reveal a lot of information about it, you know, gives you just enough to be interested, but not enough to uh, make you think that you've already read it. Anyway, and the last video is Off the Chain Episode 10 with Nigel Burns. Or, I don't know, how does he say it? Nigel Burn. Nigel Burn, yeah. Nigel (laughs) Burn. And his uh, keychain collection. So, again, he hasn't posted one of those in a while, so that, that one should be quite entertaining. I haven't had time to watch that one, because literally it just popped up yesterday. Um, moving down to the blogs, we only have one new blog, which is my review of the movie Elysium. Um, I'm actually quite proud of that of that review, because that was one that I had some time to stew over. And uh, and really get my thoughts on paper well, and eloquently write your thoughts down onto digital paper. Yes, I, I typed it into uh, Word Perfect, if you can believe it. <laughs> and, uh, then I copy and pasted it, and it's magical. The wonders anyway, of technology. And amazingly enough, I had four windows open while I was writing that. Something you can't do in Windows Eight. So poke, 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 stab, poke. stab. I just love poking at Windows 8. Um, it's going to be a sad, sad day when i got to move to Windows 8. No, by then it'll be Windows 9. I'm sorry, edition. Yeah, Windows 9, we fixed it. <laughs> anyway, alright. So, uh, those are all the videos and blogs that are new on OceanOfBees.com. Again, if you want to check those out, go to OceanOfBees.com, not to be confused with giant swarm of wasps.net. Or pondoflocusts.org. Yes. i got to come up with more of those. Anyway, so we've got uh, two news stories that uh, Phoenix and I want to talk about. One that Phoenix found and one that I found. And, you know, for the life of me, I cannot find the one that I wanted to talk about. I know it's on Kotaku. And I know I favorited it, but for some Did reason... You bookmark it? You know, I... I did, and for some reason I can't find it. 
Well, well anyway, I can... Just I, give the gist of it, then. Yeah, I'll, I'll give the gist of the story. Uh, again, this was found on Kotaku, although my link might be slightly different if I can't locate it on Kotaku again. Um, so, basically, there was a story of a kid from Illinois, eight years old, who was living with his grandmother for the summer, who decided to take her gun... I don't know how he got a hold of this, but he did. And shoot his grandmother in the head and kill her. Now, yeah, that's tragic and, and horrible. Don't get me wrong. Yep. I, I'm not making light of this at all. But what I find amazing And that this is, is still relevant. <laughs> yeah, and the fact that I found this on Kotaku again given the fact that Kotaku is a gaming site, is in the state of Illinois, apparently, you cannot be held legally responsible for anything if you're below the age of 10, because you're technically not considered uh, old enough to be held responsible. You're not cognitively there yet. Huh, that's or however, interesting. However they state that. So he's he's going to go through some anger management courses, and he's living with his parents, and going through counseling, that kind of thing. Uh, but anyway, so the sheriff from the local sheriff's department stated that minutes before this happened, he they found out that the little kid was playing Grand Theft Auto 4. So, so if you can connect the dots together, you can kind of see where this is going to go. Yes, this has already happened. Now we're just going to go through this all again. Um... Yeah, so basically, that's it. Like, they, th you know, it's another one of the blame the video games arguments. Now, my point is the same as a lot of other people's. So, a little bit of a backstory. I grew up playing a lot of violent video games when I was a kid. I'm sure Phoenix has as well. Yep. And uh, one of my favorite stories to tell to people is... We had this bowling alley. Actually, it's still there, but it was it's part of a golf course or something. But we would go there as a kid, as a family. We'd all go there and bowl from time to time. And I liked going there, one, because I liked bowling, but also because they had a, a pretty modest arcade. Uh, there wasn't a lot of arcades around here at the time, so finding any arcade was awesome. And they had awesome games. Like, they had Daytona USA. I played uh, Sunset Riders. I remember playing... Uh, Samurai Showdown, they had one of those five-cart uh, Neo Geo MVS systems. <laughs> awesome. So you'd play, like, King of Monsters 2, you'd play uh, Metal Slug, you'd play a whole bunch. And this was right around the time that fighting games started to become really popular. Because I remember they had Street Fighter 2, and I played that a lot. And uh, the other one was, of course, Mortal Kombat. Now, when they brought in Mortal Kombat, I remember the first time I walked in and they had Mortal Kombat. It was off in its own corner on the other side of the arcade from Street Fighter because Street Fighter had a line and Mortal Kombat had a line of people. And I got in line to play this Mortal Kombat because it was new. It was the one I hadn't seen yet. And I get up there and, you know, you're getting closer, you're getting closer, and you're seeing, like, the most ridiculous stuff. Guys getting their arms pulled off, you know, people getting skewered with spikes and spears and getting knocked off levels and stuff. I didn't know what was going on. So I walk over there. And I start playing, and of course, I don't know what I'm doing, so I'm just button mashing. And I don't even remember the character's name I was, but he's one of the guys who can pull the guy's head off with the spine still attached. But at the end of a match, I pulled that off. Now, here's the thing. My mom was, of course, standing next to me at the time because she was giving me quarters. And she saw me do this, pull a guy's head off. And she goes, Oh my god! That was amazing. <laughs> How did you do that? And can you do it again? <laughs> so, you know, and but my mom, like, honestly, was we we all know, you know, we would we all knew it was fake. We all knew it was ridiculous. We all knew yep. it was stupid. It's not real. It's obviously not real. Nope, that, that was that was always something that my mom came up to me when I was playing these games. She goes, "You you do know that these are not real, right?" And I go, "Yep, I know they're fake." Yeah. You know, she'd let me be. 
yeah, the the other time she we had that conversation was when I uh, I first got my Nintendo sixty four, and I got uh, Goldeneye, I believe it was. Yeah, Goldeneye 007. It was the first game I wanted for it. Mm. So I got the console, I got the game, whatever, and I remember I was sitting in my room hooking it up to my TV through the RF. Joy, but I was hooking it up. And she says, she comes in and she says to me, she goes, now you know this isn't real, right? Yep. Okay, have fun. And that was the end of the conversation. I, there isn't a single study to say that video games cause people to kill. Not one. There are ones that prove that it raises aggression. There are yep. ones that prove that it, that it changes a person's you know, mood during that time, same as music and movies do. But there was an interesting point brought up uh, by uh, one rich of Review Tech USA. I, I encourage anyone to check out his channel, it's interesting. But he talked about this topic as well, and he brought up a really interesting comparison. He said, let's assume that you buy your 16-year-old son alcohol. You go out and you buy him alcohol. Beer. Yep. And he gets behind. He gets he gets drunk, and he gets behind the wheel of a car because he can drive. He's sixteen, and he takes off down the road, and he hits somebody and kills him. Who gets blamed? Is it the the kid? Well, of course. Is it the father? That darn right. But you know who doesn't get blamed for it? The company that makes the beer. Hmm. Beer companies never get blamed for drunken driving. It's always the driver gets blamed or the person who gave them alcohol if they're underage gets blamed. But in video games, it's completely different. Whenever something happens around a video game, it's always the video game company's fault. It's never the parent's fault. It's never the kid's fault. On top of that, you have to bring into the, at the point of he's eight years old. Now, who, who is actually able to have access to a gun? Not only that, but what is he doing playing Grand Theft Auto? Yeah. yeah. I mean, like I said, I played a lot of violent video games as a kid, but, you know. That was then, this is now. That was, right, that was then, this is now. It, it, it just it blows my mind. The, the parents or somebody bought it for him. It's not that the kid did it, that, that you know. Or that the video game is the cause. Because it's not. The kids obviously got problems. But the thing is, like, they want to blame it on the video game, and, and that's just not the way you do it. What you do is you, you look at it and you go, well, who bought them the video game? The parents did. Or the grandmother did. Or somebody did. Aren't they the ones to blame for it? It's just the general scapegoat shift blame to something else because they don't want to deal with it type thing. Because nobody wants to be at fault. I can see it here, given the fact that, like I said, in that state, you can't be held responsible if you're under the age of 10. Um, so, you know. I would at least I'll poke uh, point blame at the parents and or the grandma, just because, well, one, she let them play the game, and two, she didn't secure her weapon. Yeah, I'm, yeah exactly. So, yeah, how did he get the gun is the, is the second question. One, what was he doing playing an M-rated game? That's clearly not for his age range. Yeah. Which, which if the parents were fine with that, per that's fine. But then the second question is, what was he doing with the gun, and where did he get it, and how did he get it? I guess it's a lot of questions, but, you know, all within that umbrella, there's that question of, how did he get the gun? Um, so anyway, that's just... I just hope this doesn't set off a whole new thing of, you know, oh, video games are violent. We need to we need to regulate them because it's it's not necessary. What's what's necessary is for parents to actually be parents and, be and do their job for their own kids, and yeah, Instead and lock of... up their guns and be a responsible gun owner. Yeah. Anyway, so that's. That's my two cents on that. Phoenix, if you have anything else to add, go right ahead. No, you pretty much said everything. You know, it's completely stupid. Tragic, but 
blame yeah, the video yeah. games. Is like I like I said when we started, I'm not at all downgrading the severity of this. I mean, this is a you know, I'm not making fun of this. This isn't something to be fun of. I'm just I just always get frustrated. Whenever people just instantly point their fingers at video games. Yep. Yeah. Anyway. So, uh, let's move on to our second story. Big news today from Nintendo. Nintendo's launching a brand new game console. What does it add? Absolutely nothing. It actually takes away. And what is it called? The Nintendo 2DS. Say that again. 2DS. That's not a typo, is it? No, that's not a typo. Now, you sent me this earlier today. Yep. I I honestly had to double take. I thought it was an April Fool's joke really early. <laughs> um, or really late. I encourage anyone in this podcast to look up a picture of what this thing actually looks like. Um, uh, how do you describe it? It looks like a doorstop. It looks like just a giant slab of plastic. It, yeah, it's like a... It's like a... It's a giant slab of plastic that's slightly angled at a V at the bottom. So if you can imagine like a doorstop or a door wedge, that's kind of the shape of it. Uh, Size-wise, it looks comparable to the original 3DS... Now, I've been looking around, and I haven't been able to find actual measurements for the thing yet. Um, but okay, so essentially what this is, is it's a, it's a Nintendo 3DS minus the 3D screen and the clamshell design. And a, a stereo speakers. I think that's it. O other than that, you, I think it's you, all there. You mean mono, <clears throat> mono speakers? Right, right. It's missing the stereo speaker. It's only got one speaker... Uh, on the upper left. Oh, and the the shoulder buttons are in a terrible spot. I don't know. It's just this is their new handheld. It's going to market out at a uh, or retail out at one hundred and thirty dollars, which is forty dollars cheaper than the base three DS unit. Um, and they say that they want to do this to market towards kids under the age of 7, because of course, if you look at any 3DS software, it says you have to be at least 7 to use the 3D feature. Uh, so yeah, this is one that's basically they're marketing at little children. I don't know why you'd buy a kid that young uh, 3DS, or 2DS in this case, but... Well, funny but, thing is, is that there's actually a parental control that disables the 3D on the 3DS. So it just kind of makes this more useless. Right, exactly. So, yeah, you. What I what a lot of people don't understand, and I've read a lot of the comments to a lot of the articles. People don't understand. You can turn the 3D off. You can turn the 3D off. There's a slider on the side to turn it off, or you can go into parental controls and just disable it entirely if your kid is that little. And I mostly play all of my games and. Uh, not in 3D, just because it kind of annoys me. Yeah, personally, I play most of my games in 2D. There's a, uh, Every once in a while, I'll bump it up to 3D for a while just to check it out. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do, too. Generally, whenever I get a new game, I just kind of play it like an hour in 3D just to say, you know, what it's like, and then I just kind of turn it off again just because, I don't know, it just kind of bothers me. It's... Most of the games don't utilize it very well. And most of the time it just ends up being a headache. Um, I mean, I like the 3D effect and all, and it was really awesome, but I don't know. I would just much rather... It's just a gimmick that kind of gets in the way. Yeah, it ends up just kind of being a gimmick most of the time. But, you know, this, <laughs> this new 2DS... This is going to be weird to say it now. This new 2DS uh, seeks to remedy that by just not having a 3D screen. But there's just a couple things about it that bother me. One is the button placement on on the damn thing. They've got everything crammed somewhere near the middle of the device. Just imagine 
like opening your 3DS if you have one completely or a DS. all the way or DS or whatever and moving all the buttons to the middle. Yeah, move them to the hinge. Obviously cuz there is no hinge on this one. Uh the shoulder buttons are directly above the screen. I mean, they're not even like offset in the back at all. They're literally like they're up just, above they're just the at screen. They're just the tippy top of the entire thing. Yeah, think of it more like like a PlayStation Portable or a PlayStation Vita setup where they're up top like that on the they they're basically part of the edge of the device. Um yeah, so overall it's the exact same device except it's lacking a stereo speaker. It only has the one and there's no 3D, which takes away the entire point of having a Nintendo yeah, 3DS. And it doesn't have the clamshell design. Right, and it's got this new what they call slate design. They've been calling it the slate design. Basically, it's one hunk of plastic with two screens on it. Like just imagine crank like taking your DS or 3DS or whatever opening it all the way up so it's completely flat open and that's it that's you know you can't close it um now a couple things this raises for me is how are you going to put that in your pocket because it is a giant slab of meat because <laughs> it is a plastic yeah because it is a giant slab um i mean I, I you know i've been playing with game boys and handhelds since i was a kid and the the original Game Boy was a was a stretch, but you could still kind of fit that in a pocket um, most of the time. Sometimes you couldn't, so you'd have to buy like a probably a spare or a, uh, an extra carrying case for it. Uh, my worry is getting those screens. I'm always just picky about my screens getting scratched and just that. Uh, especially with this being targeted at younger kids, you know, you don't really think they take care of their screens, so those are just going to be. Scratch City. Yeah, since it doesn't close in a clamshell like design, it, it it's just gonna be more susceptible to scratching. Um But okay, let's I I think this is I think this will end up being like the Game Boy Micro. Where it's gonna come out, it's gonna try to be the budget because I remember the Game Boy Micro came out uh, and it was basically the Game Boy Micro was a Game Boy Advance that was much smaller. It was about just a little bit bigger than the size of a cartridge for the Game Boy Advance. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's all it did. It played Game Boy Advance games. It had no backwards compatibility with the rest of the Game Boy line. And you played on it. And it had a smaller screen, but same resolution, if I understand right. I forget. It had a smaller screen, and everything was smaller. But, uh, and it kind of just faded out of existence. Like, they, they launched it to see if people were still interested and in the And it platform. came out, and then it just disappeared. Like now, the other... In <laughs> so, so I'm kind of thinking this is the same idea. They're going to launch this thing to just to try to get as many people in on it as possible. Like I said, they're dropping the price $40 from the uh, original 3DS. And, uh... Yeah, that's basically it. Like it is that's literally it. I like I said, I think they're trying to market this towards they said they're trying to market this towards below seven year olds, but and the price point of hundred and thirty, that might be the the cutting point for a lot of people when it comes to buying one of the systems, you know, they look at it and they go, Oh, it's hundred and seventy or two hundred for the three D S XL, uh, that's a lot of money. Oh, hundred and thirty? Uh yeah, I could do hundred and thirty. And they're not really missing anything spec-wise. I mean, it still has a 3D camera on it, on the back. So you can still take 3D photographs and video. Oh, right, it does. But you can't but, actually see it in 3D because the screen isn't 3D. Wasn't the way to dictate that just to slide the thing to 3D? Like, yeah, like I'm saying is, like, the... <laughs> the 3DS has a slider to put it on and off. Right. The 3D it does effect. Have, it does have 3D cameras on the back. Well, what's the point of that? <laughs> I don't... Well, I'm assuming because all the software that was already made for it is made utilizing two cameras at once. Yeah. It's it's one of those specs they just can't take down to one camera because they have the AR cards and they have the different augmented reality stuff in games. 
so they want to keep it as close to the original spec as possible. Like I said, the only thing they really took out was the 3D screen and the stereo speaker, which aren't really big changes. Um, well, I mean, they're huge changes, but they're not enough to have to reissue all these dev kits and stuff to developers. Um, so yeah, that's that's the 2DS. Again, I, I question why. I, I guess I see what they're trying to do. It'll be interesting to see if the thing even sells. But I'm... I don't know. I'm still reserving judgment, personally. Eh, it's pretty much just the budget 3DS. More yeah. Or less. It's like they wanted to do another price drop, but they couldn't figure out how to make the system any cheaper. Then some guy in a, in a boardroom went, Wait a minute! If we just take out that 3D screen that's costing us a crap ton to make, we could make it cheaper. Hmm. And then everybody hugged him and he got a raise. Anyway, I can see I can see what they're trying to do. They want to cut the price down as low as they can get it. They want to make it as affordable as possible. I mean, that is one thing that Nintendo has always said about what, regarding their handhelds is they wanted to try to they always try to make their handhelds as accessible as possible. That's why you didn't see a color screen on the original Game Boy. That's why you didn't see a backlit screen for a long time. It's because it just raises the price too much. They want to be able to get as many people playing as possible. Yeah. I still think this is a dumb idea, <laughs> but I I can I, I I guess I can understand where they're coming from. I just don't think it's going to sell, especially considering that the last three months, the 3DS has outsold every other console on the market. It's the top selling device, video game device, and uh, so, I don't know, it's, it'll be interesting to see what comes of this. So, moving forward, we're going to talk about what we've the games we've been playing. Hmm. And do you want to start or should I? Uh, let's have you go this time. Alright. So I haven't been playing too much, but just a lot of new stuff because it was my birthday recently. So I've gotten a few, uh, few new games to mess around with. The first one being uh, Mario and Luigi Dream Team on 3DS. I played it for, at this point, about th three and a half hours, maybe. So not too long. I know the game, some people have said, goes as far as 50 hours in. Pretty impressive. Yeah. But uh, there's other games in the stack that <laughs> make me really excited. Yep. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 part of the Luigi Mario & Luigi series that I think is a spinoff of the Paper Mario series, if I'm not mistaken. Uh... Well, it's got that same kind of action RPG really? feel. Yeah. It's got a similar feel to the combat system and everything else, so a lot of people consider it like a spiritual successor or a spin-off. Um, it's, it's the next game in that whole series. I mean, they're, they are chronological to a way. With Mario & Luigi is a series that I haven't actually played all that much. Uh, the last one I played was Shame Bowser's... on and you. I know, I feel <laughs> terrible. Oh... How will I ever live with myself? Okay, I'm over it. So, I played Bowser's Inside Story before, uh, which was a game my niece had, and I helped her through a lot of the tough parts, which was pretty much the majority of the game. But, uh, which, I found that game to be fun and, and really charming, so I picked this one up mainly because of the TV commercial. It just made the game look really interesting, being able to jump inside Luigi's head and uh, mess around inside of his dreams. It's just really, really interesting. The um, the game itself is, like I said, more more or less the same thing as the previous game. So if you enjoyed any of the Luigi Mario games, or Mario and Luigi games, excuse me, you know, this one should be right up your alley. It feels pretty much exactly the same. As far as the story goes so far, you, you land on this, you get invited to this island called Pillow Island, by this doctor named Dr. Snoozemore. Ugh, puns. <laughs> and the <laughs> and you find this artifact that is a pillow, and
and whenever somebody sleeps on the pillow, uh, they can their dreams like manifest, and you can jump inside of them. And of course, Luigi, being himself, falls asleep on top of the pillow, and Mario jumps inside of his head. Uh, Princess Peach gets kidnapped by uh, what I'm calling Nightmare Mist at this point, but it's just this big purple cloud with evil-looking eyes. I don't think it actually has a name yet. Um, so yeah, and you're battling around inside of his head. It's actually a lot more interesting than it sounds. Uh, the writing is really good. The humor is really spot on. I actually found myself smiling and chuckling at little bits of it. There's one part in particular I like where when you first run into Luigi inside of his own head, uh, the little star sprite guy says, uh, he goes, oh, this isn't Luigi, this is Luigi's version of himself. So as you can see, he's slightly thinner, slightly taller, and he smells better. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know, like, I chuckled at that bit. Um, so yeah, I've been enjoying that game. Uh, but there's been a couple more games that I've been playing that have just been sucking up my time. The biggest one, and I think this is the only other game I've really put any time into so far, so it's the last one that I'll mention, uh, is Pikmin 3 for the Wii U. I bought this one a little while back, and I've played about, I'm on like day 18 now, and Pikmin 3 is really, really good. It is. Uh, more or less, it plays a lot like the other Pikmin games. Interestingly enough, though, the Wii U has that, you know, gamepad with the screen on it and everything. That is critical to the game no matter how you decide to play. Because, like, they allow you to control the game either with the gamepad, which I tried for a little while and just didn't like, yeah. or or you can play it with the nunchuck and uh, Wiimote, like the other two Pikmin games that were ported over to the Wii. Hmm. And that mode works a lot better. But the problem is that you lose the ability of a map. Like, the map always stays on the gamepad. So what I end up doing is, since I bought the deluxe black Wii U, it comes with this little plastic stand that you can set the gamepad in. So what I'll do is I'll set that off to the side, put the gamepad in it, and use that as kind of my map to guide me around. Um, a couple things they changed. You get three captains in this game instead of uh, two, like in Pikmin 2, so there's an extra captain. They're from a different planet than Olimar and Louis are, so they're actually searching for food. And so the point of the game is you have to go around and not only find parts of your ship... Well, actually, there's only one part of your ship you have to find, which is the hyperdrive key or something like that, or cosmic drive key. Whatever that lets you go into hyperspace to get back home. But in the meantime, while you're looking for the key, you have to find fruit because you juice the fruit to create uh, uh, food for yourself. Yeah, excuse me, food for yourself. So at the end of every day, you drink one of the bottles of fruit juice, and if you don't have any more fruit juice, the game is over. So it really has that kind of like... It's a good balance between Pikmin 1 and Pikmin 2, where Pikmin 1 had the 30-day time limit, and Pikmin 2 had the no time limit, essentially. Um, this is a good mix of the two, where you can spend just a couple days amassing fruit and create a really good buffer, and then spend the next couple days just running around and searching for various objects. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually a really good mix of the two. The, the biggest thing that they changed was there is no more... I, I don't I forget what exactly they called it, but it's like I think I called it the rally cry from Pikmin one and two where you can just have them all run towards like run forward mm -hmm. all the Pikmin. Uh in this one you have to actually target what you want to attack and then shake the nunchuck and then they'll charge forward at it. Uh it's a little clunky, but it works pretty well once you get the hang of it. Uh the other thing is motion control. Yeah, you also, <laughs> yeah, you also shake the nunchuck to dismiss everybody into the various groups, which I think works really well. But uh, the biggest change they did was the was on the map you can actually set a set a waypoint for one of the captains, mm -hmm. and then just hit go, and he and he'll run off towards wherever you set the waypoint. So if you're out in 
in the world with all three captains, and you want one of them to maybe go back to the spaceship for whatever reason, you just select the captain, go on your map, set the waypoint, hit go, and then switch over to another captain, and you don't have to worry about him. And he just walks, you know, barring any unforeseen problems, running into creatures, whatever. But, I mean, he will go to the waypoint. It's really handy, I find, when I don't really know how to get to a place, but I can see it on the map, like, oh, I need to go there, but I forgot how to get there. Yeah. Set the waypoint, hit go, and the game will just take you there. Your character will just go there. It's actually extremely handy if you are uh, very forgetful of where things are. Um, graphically, the game is impressive as all hell. I'm not a graphics whore, but this game is just really nice and crisp and clean. Uh, everything has a really nice sheen to it. The Pikmin look much better, sharper than they did in the first two Pikmin. Uh, oh, on top of that, there's two new types of Pikmin in the game. Uh, one that flies, which I haven't gotten around to finding yet. But the one that you find pretty much right away is a black Pikmin that they call Rock Pikmin. They look like little chips of obsidian rock. And they're very good at uh, two particular things. One is they can break through crystals, which are these glass-like structures everywhere. Uh, crystal walls, crystal uh, structures, and different things like that. And the other thing is, they do massive damage to creatures. So, uh, if you're going to fight a creature, you just chuck them, and it's like throwing... It's like using a slingshot, almost. And you can pretty much incapacitate a lot of the enemies really quickly. Oh, another thing is, they don't actually get squished. They cannot be squished. Oh, that's nice. They just kind of get pounded into the dirt, and then they climb out. There was actually one gigantic creature I had to fight where um, it was like a four-legged spider, I guess is a good way to say it. Mm -hmm. and it had this big ball in the middle of it. So what you had to do was, he would stomp all over the place, but since I just brought Black Pikmin with me, he couldn't hurt any of them. And so they would just climb up his legs and beat the crap out of his little ball head, and eventually I killed him. Um, oh, that's another thing, is they can also... Uh, the thing about the onions. Whenever you find a new onion, rather than in the other game where you had the three colored onions sitting at your base, they all morph into one onion. Um, which at first I didn't really like, but the more and more I play the game, the more and more I enjoy just having the one onion. Because it has everything in it. It has all the different colored Pikmin, and everything you need. So you don't have to worry about which Pikmin, you know, running from onion to onion, getting your different colors. You just go there, set yourself up, and start playing. Uh, oh, and the, the onion actually does this really cool, like, lava lamp thing, where all the different colors kind of intermingle in the top. Mm -hmm. It's it's really trippy to look at, and I actually, I actually lost, like, a minute of my time just looking at it one time. Uh, no, but it's an amazing game. Uh, using both the nunchuck and Wiimote with the gamepad is a little clunky at first, but you get used to it. Uh, one thing I can say that's really good is when you tap the touchscreen on the gamepad, the game pauses. So if you just need to quick do something, just reach over, quick tap the screen, and then you can do whatever you want, and then go back to using the Wiimote nunchuck. Hmm. So that's really good that they, that they did that way. Um, I think that's all I've been playing pretty much. The, couple things here and there, but that's those are the two that I that I really sunk a lot of time into. Alright. So that's it for me. Alright, then uh, I'll cover what I've been playing. Oh, there is one other game that I've been playing for hundreds of hours this week, but I'll let you bring that up. Yeah, it's, it's the same game. Which is what I'll mention first, because that's where it is in my list. Going down my Steam list. So, of course, Payday 2 came out a couple of weeks ago. Been pretty much playing it non-stop, you know, whenever I'm not working. But, uh... How many hours does Steam say you have in Payday 2 right now? Uh... Quick, go to my profile, because it tells me there, too. 44 hours. I have 44 hours into the game already. Aw, uh, I have 24. What happened? <laughs> No, oh, no, you no, know. No, so this is usual. But, yeah, um, you always amass a lot more. Well, I have Pikmin three. Yeah, you don't. You don't have Pikmin three. Yeah, yeah. 
But uh, we pretty much covered everything about Payday the Heist to last podcast, so I really don't need to go into it. And yes, it is a fun game if you like the whole heist theme. Uh, it's not a heist simulator, so don't look for realistic tactics, but um, just just the whole thought of planning it out with your teammates. I mean, sitting in the lobby screen, you know, we sit there for a good five, ten minutes just planning out how we're going to do these things, how we're going to do these heists. You know, do you have this specific skill? No? Okay, we're going to have to work around that. Do you have this? Okay, good. And it, it, it's just... It's just really collaborative when you get you and your three other teammates, whether they be friend or pubs, and it's just so satisfying to play through, even if you fail a heist. It's even more satisfying because it's harder, (laughs) Mm -hmm. because you got to get through all the cops. But... um, yeah, the fact that you can build your skill tree in particular ways, then then you get into a room and you just go, okay, here's what I have, what do you have? Okay, well, I have the ability of Smooth Talker. All right, great, so you do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I kind of feel a little bit useless with my character because I'm going mostly Technician, uh, so I have things like Shape Charges and uh, a Sentry Gun and stuff like that, which only come in handy if we're going to go loud. But if we end up just doing the whole thing stealth, I'm not that useful of, of a character. <laughs> well, you're given enough skill points to... Uh at least get to the top of two skill trees. So if you want to dabble somewhere else, you can. Yeah, I'm still going to have quite a few skill points coming my way because I'm not. I'm just level 50 as of yeah, yeah, way. yeah. We're halfway there, but uh, I'm mostly going enforcer and mastermind. So I can take the heavy hits. I got all the good armor. My, I get shotgun buffs, things like that, as well as I get pretty decent crowd control. I can get. Uh, cops to surrender and then I can strap a bomb to them to have them fight on my side that is the best skill ever <laughs> it's like just in the middle of a firefight just a heavy SWAT just starts firing in on the other police officers and, 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 like, yes. and, he, and he can't get taken down because his front is impenetrable to bullets yep so but no, that, that's great I love that skill yep so there's that uh, moving on I actually found a use for Gary's mod. Oh yes, you were telling me about this. I on, honestly, I bought it in a in a two pack on Steam because it, it, it it's a two pack of Counter Strike Source and Gary's mod, and I kind of needed Counter Strike Source to play other mods that I do kind of enjoy dabbling around in. So I just grabbed both of them because why not? And um. But I've never had a real use for Gary's mod. The uh, the entire thing just is completely overwhelming. I mean, I know I gotta probably just sink a lot of time into figure stuff out in it, but I really just don't want to mess around in a sandbox. I want to actually do something. But um, recently, I believe it was the start of this week actually, a new game mode was released. Um, from the website Mr. Green Man Gaming, not to be confused with Green Man Gaming, but um, where one of the users on there released a game mode called Stop It Slender, which is a game mode where it, it's basically a game of Slenderman. You walk through levels finding the eight pages, and whenever the players find the eight pages, then the Slenderman loses. The thing is, though, is that one of those players out of however many people are on the server is the Slenderman. And it's just just fun to play as the Slenderman. You don't do anything, but you just... What what you do is you walk around invisible. And then you just click the mouse to turn yourself visible. You can only do this when no one is looking in your direction. So it's it's not like broken like that. But um... It's really great because initially people like to group together. I've played like a couple public servers, but people like to group together and then what you do as the slender is you kind of pop around the corner, you know, wait for them to come around and then you appear and then they'll split off because they're not really paying attention to where they're going. They're just trying to get away from you. And then you just kind of pick them off one by one. Um, 
by just having them look at you and uh, you can see the location of all the players when you're the Slenderman as well as their I guess it's called fright status when they're green they're not really afraid but when they're red you know going pure red then they pr practically die um, playing as the player however all of the levels are extremely dark which you know as slender game that's how it is um, every now and then if you don't turn off your light it'll shut off automatically for like a good five six seconds which isn't good so it, it, char right. it, it charges itself like if you turn it off it'll charge itself for like two seconds and then you don't have to worry about it for a while but if you keep it on then it kind of goes off for a longer period of time than what it would be required to charge but um, you just go around the levels if you see the Slenderman it has the same effects as the actual game and you collect the pages collect all eight pages the Slenderman loses Slenderman kills all the players Slenderman wins and it's just <laughs> really fun because y you might think that it being a horror game that playing with other people doesn't make it scary no it's still scary you know I've jumped plenty of times just playing through it then all of a sudden the Slenderman's in front of me I turn around and you know then he's there in the other hallway that I tried to go down uh, oh yeah playing as the Slenderman you do have uh, you do move I think twice as fast as players when you're invisible but when you're visible then you move like half as fast and whenever you're spotted you instantly stop mm -hmm. but um but no it's, it's really really fun to play with and Actually, I was just trying to get together a few friends, you know, messaging on Skype before you called to see if you can play it, because I do have the whole server thing set up to a private server that we can all play on. I'd be up but, for that later. But, um, yeah, I mean, the only requirement is you need Gary's Mod, and then you need to download the, well, subscribe to the Stop It Slender game mode within the, uh, within, what is it called, the workshop. And you, you don't need to download the maps because when you jump into the game, as long as your options are set to download everything from the server, you'll download the maps themselves, so you really don't got to worry about that. But um, I know it's it's a fun game mode. You know, it's it's one of the few. I also got to get you guys to play Prop Hunt because that looks fun too. But um, but yeah, I've I've been playing that on and off, getting friends every now and then playing in public servers. I just think it'd be more fun playing with just my friends, you know, over Skype, because then, yeah, I don't know, it'd just be fun to me. And moving on, I recently got Carlo Juarez Gunslinger. Believe I've talked about this game too. A while ago, Marauder talked it up, and I do agree with everything he says on it. It is just a blast to play. Isn't it fun? It's, it's so much fun. really fun. I mean, it's just a straight-up shooter, but it's just fun to play through. The The narrative of how the story is told is extremely interesting and involving, and th the gunplay is spectacular. Yep. It, it, it's just it's just really fun to play. If you're, if you're looking for a good shooter, get Call of Juarez Gunslinger. It's only, 15, Doesn't it? it's only $15 on Steam, which isn't a lot. For such a great game. Yeah, no, it honestly feels like a forty dollar game, fifty dollar game. It it feels like they put a lot more work into it than fifteen dollars <laughs> worth. Um but but it it's the most rewarding shooter I've played until payday two. Or even payday. Like it's one of the just when you shoot them and they're on the run and you can shoot them while you're jumping and you get all the bonus points and you level up, it just feels so good. And you have that what, what, what's that skill called where everything just kind of goes slow-mo and you shoot all the guys that are highlighted oh it's like called like last breath or something like that or it's like right before you're gonna get well, well no no that's that's the uh that's yeah that is last breath where if that's oh marksman it, i think it, it's called it, marksman okay 
But uh, but no, you that, mean where that's, you do the whole like Max Payne slow yeah, down thing. Yeah, yeah, slow down thing. All the guys are red thing, and you shoot them, and then just blood sprays, and it's 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 really satisfying to do that. And plus the whole uh, last breath, final shot thing, where if you're gonna die from this last shot, if this ability is charged, it'll go into a slow mo thing where you'll see the guy fire the shot, and then the bullet will slowly kind of come towards you, and you can dodge either left or right to dodge the bullet and and you if you get it if if you you get it right you live if you get it wrong you die (laughs) yep but it's kind of a great second chance type thing instead of it being oh you're dead you know but but the game is difficult you do have to utilize cover you can't just sit out in the open shooting guys you know you do have to think somewhat strategically as you're moving through the level so that you don't yeah. get shot which is great and it, it's just it's just overall fun to play it is it is a lot of fun and the whole the whole uh, playing along with his narration mm-hmm. just gives the game a, a very distinct style that's really fun now did you did you get to the point where he starts changing things like he'll say one thing. And yeah, yeah. I'm. I the, the level that I just played as is the mine level. Okay, so you got where, to the part where, where I got to the part where he's like, I could go in this first mine here. So then you go through, play through the first mine, and then it leads to well, you practically dying. He goes, but and then like everything. I knew that then, wasn't the best. Thing. Then, then everything rewinds and goes. But I knew that wasn't the best thing. So I found this ladder over here, and then the ladder appears, and then you go down that way in an alternate route, and it, it, it's just, it's just kind of fun to see. Like, it's kind of like multi-pathing, but kind of not, because because you, you are still kind of following a linear path. But it, it's just fun to see, you know, how things change up as you're playing through, as well as what could have happened, as well. Yeah, overall, it is a very linear game, um, but but it is so much fun. It just it just goes to show you what what can be done on a budget. I mean, that's ob- it's obviously a budget game, but it certainly doesn't feel like it. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing that I do notice that I can I can see annoying people and what I have seen in the forums is that it has this type of stylized border around the entire screen. So if if any type of black bar or anything on your screen bothers you, then this might bother you because there's no way to turn it off. And oh, yeah, it kind of has that, like, burnt edge look. Yeah. I You know, I never really even noticed it. I, I never noticed it. Like, I mean, if you're specifically looking at it, you'll see it, but while you're playing the game, you just won't see it. it, it, it it's it's completely unnoticeable while you're playing the game. But that's one you, thing that, that's one thing that I can think that people might nitpick about with it. Yeah, yeah. I just got you just get so absorbed into the yeah into the game that you don't even notice it. Mm-hmm. But I I could see that I guess kind of bothering people, but. Oh, oh, another thing I like is since you're playing through his dreams, whenever you do get hit, it, like, tears the... Oh, yeah. It, like, rips open your vision and shows, like, this, like, white light behind the tear. Mm-hmm. Because so, you're technically playing through your own memories, and ah, it's just so cool. Yep. Yeah, I know, but that's a game I highly recommend. I, I beat it a while ago. I want to play through it again. Because you can do, like, a new game plus... We can take all the abilities you have and go back through the game. Nice. Um, yeah, so I want to try playing it through New Game Plus, just for fun. And it's a pretty long game too. It took me like twelve or thirteen hours. For fifteen bucks, you can't complain. Yeah, when Call of Duty single player is literally four hours long, and that costs sixty. <laughs> yeah, I mean. The only downside is there is no multiplayer to this. I, w- I really wish there was some sort of multiplayer. Um, but I, I can't really complain because what's there is amazing. Mm-hmm. They had a they had a goal and something they wanted to accomplish. You know, make a really good western shooter, and they they nailed it. Totally nailed it. 
completely agree with you. So, no need to tack on useless <laughs> multiplayer if that's not even the point. Yep. Alright. Alright. Uh, lastly, on my Steam list is a game that I just recently got because it was marked down to two dollars is Rock of Ages. Oh, I do remember seeing this. It's like some kind of weird... It, it, it's, it's, it's a game where you play as a giant rolling rock going down the hill, smashing through your enemy defenses, only to uh, break down the enemy's gate whoever you're going up against. It's kind of like a duel thing where he has his own rock going through the level and I have my rock going through the level attacking him. And it's it's fun. I, I only played it for like an hour because I was just trying to see how it plays and how, how well it, you know, goes through. And it, it's, it is fun. I'll, I'll say that. Um, it's really enjoyable, the story that goes behind it. There are some historical names that are mentioned, some mythological things. Don't know if they have actually any relevance to the mythology, but um, the way that it's told and portrayed through the game is just all visuals. There's no talking, whatever. It's it, You hear grunts and groans from the characters, but um, it's, it's highly entertaining. And then uh, the gameplay is broken off into two segments. There's the building phase, which is what you do when your rock is being, you know, remade after you've used it. And then there's the rolling the rock phase. During the building phase, there's multiple placements that you can just place down to help defend slash break your opponent's rock. Or just weaken it so that he doesn't do as much damage against your gate. And these range from just towers that you can place, you can place catapults, you can place <laughs> a herd of cows and other off things but um, you can only place those on the light brown areas within the map and you just set them up and hope that uh, the guy can't get through them and then the rolling phase is when you're controlling the rock, going downhill, smashing through stuff. The more stuff you smash through, the more money you get towards, you know, buying uh, placements during the map mode or upgrading your rock. Because if you have some money left over, you can buy, like, uh, steel banding around your rock to help, you know, strengthen him up so he can take down more stuff. At the, you know effect of damaging a rock, making it weaker towards the other guy's gate. But um, but no, it's it's really enjoyable just and kind of satisfying actually just watching yourself smash through the enemy placements and ultimately smashing down his gigantic gate. And um, at the end you do use your rock to roll over the guy and squish him, which is kind of funny. But um, like I said, I've only played a about an hour of it. Haven't really gotten too deep into it, but I'm pretty sure I'll be enjoying it as I play through its story mode. Uh, I know it does tout a multiplayer mode. I'm not really big on competitive game modes, which is kind of what it is, but I don't know. I'll give it a shot if any one of my friends buys it. I don't know if it's still $2. If it is, I would say just get it because it's $2. It was a game I saw on, uh, it was part of one of the Xbox's summer game things that they did a while back. It's like yep. one of the featured yep. games. Yep, it's still $2 through September 2nd, so, yeah. Hmm. So, I just say if you want an enjoyable game that does have some great humor in it and is pretty satisfying to watch yourself smash stuff, then why not? It's $2. So I'd pick it up for two dollars. So something to get that. On the console side, uh, I've continued to play through Persona Four. Got through the fifth dungeon. Console side, you're using your PS2 emulator. It still counts. Still yeah, I know. Technically playing a PS2, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, still playing through that. Great game. I am 35 hours in. 
actually more. I think I'm around 38, 39 now. Um, I believe there's eight dungeons, nine if you're going for the true end, which I'm not going to be able to, because I hear that you need to uh, get a lot of social links pretty high throughout the game, which I'm kind of sucking at. But um, but I can do a new game plus through it where you know I can have all the players stats and skills and levels all the way up so then all I'd have to really worry about is social links afterwards. So then that would constitute another playthrough, but as I'm sitting right now I'm close to around 40 hours. I'm at, I just beat Dungeon 5 of 8 and uh, yeah, it's highly enjoyable. So if you want to play it, you can generally pick it up for 20 bucks on the PS2 or if you have a PS Vita you can p pick it up on that. Um, it's it's either forty or thirty dollars now. Really? On the Vita, yeah. Hmm. Well, the ba the base oh, game is oh, oh, forty. For, oh, oh, for the Vita. Okay. Yeah, the yeah the, on the Vita it's forty dollars for the base game. It's thirty dollars. I think you can get it for thirty on Amazon and places like that because hmm. I think they price dropped it a little bit. Um, otherwise, the collector's edition um, is like. Stupid expensive now. I don't even know. Well, whatever. Uh, the thing that actually might get me to play the Vita version, if I ever do get around to getting a Vita, I would buy that game. Which, by the way, um, I just want to—I just want to drop this. They did price cut those. Yep, yep, they did. And if you buy a 3D, a 3G model, excuse me, which is the same price as the Wi-Fi model, and you get a contract through AT&T, they will give you a free memory card and a free game. Nice. Still probably won't do it because I don't want to be contracted, but whatever. No, it's it's completely pointless. You can't really do much with it on 3G, but you know. Yeah. But um, but with it being re-released on the Vita, there are some updates to it. There is new added content to it as well, which might make it more appealing than the PS2 version. But uh, I, I don't know. I just enjoy playing through it on the PS2. Just... I don't really have anything to say because I really haven't played it all that much on the Vita. So. I, I, I don't know. I just enjoy the look of it. I mean, I don't know how much it's graphically it has been updated on the Vita, but um, I don't know. It, it just it just has its own look to it, which I think will last generations. But yep, I I do highly recommend it. I do hi actually highly re recommend getting into any of the Shin Megami Tensei games. Though, word of warning, they are difficult. They do not handhold you at all. Um, you will die if you're not used to it. So, speaking of that, I also recently got Shin Megami Tensei 4 for the Yay! 3DS. I got the uh, limited edition version, which was the last copy at GameStop that they had, thankfully. But um, but I've played. I think I'm around five, six hours into it. I haven't been playing it as much because there's just other things that I've been playing. But um, my brother told me he he played through it all, um, doing most of the side quests and everything, and he clocked in at around fifty-four hours, and that's just getting one ending. I heard there's four. So if you're a completionist, you've got around 250 hours ahead of you for this. So at the price of $50, I'd say you get your money's worth. Oh, yeah. But, um, but with that being pretty much at the core of the Shin Megami Tensei, it is the Shin Megami Tensei game. It's not like an offshoot like the Persona games or the... I, I forget the ones... Digital Devil Saga versions on the DS and 3DS. Um, it is the core game, meaning it is the most difficult version of all of the Shin Megami Tensei games. And I will have to admit, I've only gone down three floors of this dungeon. I've died five times already. <laughs> okay. So, yes, it, it is difficult if you're, if you're the type of masochist like I am and enjoy getting your ass handed to you, then go on, play this game. Um, the customization and demon fusing is a lot nicer in this version than, say, Persona 4, 
where if uh, one of your demons levels up and gets an ability, you can actually take that ability and put it on your main character. Like recently my dwarf demon had a very useful ability, I think it's probably called Tsukukaja, where it raises everyone's attack, which is amazing. Because you gotta do everything you can to get the big numbers in that. But, um... So I just basically took that from him, and whenever you fuse demons, you can basically add, remove, move the skills between one another two. You get to choose which skills you want, which everything, so it's really, really forgiving in that sense. Same with if a demon is able to, like, convert one skill into another, it'll actually tell you what that skill is, compared to them not doing it in other games. So then you can just have the choice of, you know, doing it or not, if it's worth it. So you, because you know exactly what it is. Uh, the battle system. The battle system is really interesting and actually kind of fun. Uh, basically, if you get a critical strike, you strike their enemy's weakness. Um, that character will get an extra turn that round. Um, if you have all four demons and you do it, you know, all four times, and you can attack up to eight times per round. Uh, same thing applies to your enemies, however, is if they get a critical strike, they attack one of your creature's weak points, they get extra turns during that as well. Um, if you miss, it uses up two turns, and same goes for the enemies as well. And I, I don't know, you really, really, really have to pay attention to what you're doing in battle because one screw-up can mean life or death. And I'm not kidding on that. Um, one of the recent boss battles that I went up against, these things wrecked me the first time. I stood no chance. The first turn they went, three of my four demon, three of my demons were dead and I was still left standing with only like ten health. <laughs> you know, it, it was terrible. But after I learned what their weakness was, um, you get the ability to spy on, you know, the enemies to get an analysis of what they um, are weak against. It gives you a listing of everything as well as their HP and, you know, what abilities they have if you uh, have that upgraded. But, um, but the, the battle system is pretty interesting. It's it's definitely different from any other Persona game that I've played, and <laughs> it's brutal. It's very brutal. The uh, main thing with the core game of Shin Megami Tensei is the fact of recruiting demons. This is you basically talking to the demons you're fighting. And what happens in between this is they'll make demands such as give me money, let me take some of your health, um, give me an item, whatnot. And these enemies can just, they can be total dicks about it. You know, th this one, this one, I cannot believe happened to me. I gave him like almost all of my money, five items, some of my health, twice, and he said, okay, I'm good, bye. And then they just, just left the battle. Didn't join me. Didn't do anything. Just, just left. <laughs> All that was wasted. But um, there are things that you can do in there. You can, there, you generally have an option to cheat if you don't want to give them the money or the item or whatnot. You can try to talk your way out of it. Some enemies are more smarter than others, so they'll call you out on it and then just basically tell you to die, and you know the battle will start. And whenever you talk, I do believe it uses up you everyone's turn. So the smart thing to do is if you're trying to get a specific enemy, kill all the other ones in the battle so that, you know, if things go sour, then he'll be the only enemy attacking you instead of everyone. But, um... But there's that... Then there's also demon fusing, which, you know, you can create new powerful demons. Uh, you can call back demons that you've registered within the compendium at a price. So if you 
want to get back this special demon that had some special ability that you always used and you just fused it, you can buy it back. Um, so it's not that bad. With microtransaction money. <laughs> no, no, it's all in-game money. There is DLC that you can buy, um, some of its story. I don't know how it plays through the story. I'm probably going to play through the game vanilla first. Then I might invest in buying all the DLC afterwards and play through it again just to see what it all affects. But, um... But, yeah. There is one free DLC for it, however, that gives you a couple of side quests and some new armor that you can unlock. Which is nice. But, um... Is that free to... For until a particular date, or is that just free? I don't know. I don't know. I just popped into the downloadable content section just to see what was in there, and it just said free, so I'm like, yep, why not? It's free. Alright, sounds good. But, um, like I said, the game is really difficult, so if you want a challenge, this is your game. You can buy it both physical and digital through the eShop. Um, me, I'm a physical person, so I had to get the physical version. But, you know, if you want the convenience of digital, go for it. You know, I don't really have anything to say about that. And, yeah, no. It's, it's a pretty fun, in-depth, hard RPG. So, and plus you get your money's worth. So, there's that. And I believe that is everything that I have been playing. Well, one last thing is, uh, I think it's called Nano Assault on 3DS. It's only available in the uh, eShop. Uh, yeah, Nano Assault EX. Basically, it's a shooter. You ride, you ride around in viruses, shooting things that appear. You collect DNA pieces. Um, if you enjoy shooters, you know, I'm pretty sure you'd like it. Um, right now it is half off on the eShop, making it $7 instead of the 14 it is. What game is this? Nano Assault EX. Oh, that was that, like, virus one you showed me. Yeah, yeah. And so, right now it's half off, which surprisingly, you know, a digital service is actually putting stuff on sale. But, uh, if you're looking for a shooter, you know, something to do. Why not drop seven bucks on it? I've, I've played through about four or five of the levels. Uh, it is kind of difficult sometimes. You do lose track of some bullets. It is kind of a bullet hell-esque game. So, but it's fun. It's, it's a good time waster, I'll say that. And for half off of its original price, don't know how long that's going to last. I think till the end of this month. So, yeah, get it soon. All right, um, cool. Yeah, that should be everything that I've been playing. It's not too many. No, well, five games. But Payday Two's been sucking up most of your time, <laughs> so it's understandable. Yep. yep, yep, yep. I love that game. I'm the same way. It's like I come, I come home from work or whatever, and it's just like, oh, what do I want to play today? Oh, everyone's oh. playing Payday Two. Yeah, yeah. I'll join. Yeah. Well, all my friends are playing Payday Two. Might as well play that. I mean, Pikmin 3 I, I put a lot of time into, but that's only because it's the only... Or I should say, it's the first Wii game worth a damn. <laughs> or yeah. wor Wii U game, excuse me, worth a damn to come out in a long time. Um, I know they just released also the Super Luigi U game, mm -hmm. which I'm also looking to get. Um, I know it's been downloadable for a while, but I wanted to get the physical copy. So. Yep. That's on store shelves as of a couple days ago. So at some point I want to run out and get that. Um, Alright, cool. Well, so that's everything? Yep, that's everything. Alright, so we're going to close this one out. I think this one will be a little bit shorter than normal, but hey. Again, if you guys... <laughs> well, don't we normally shoot for 45 minutes with generally go an hour and a half? <laughs> yeah, we do. Whatever. It's, gener Whatever. It's, it's, it's generally a couple hours shorter than most other podcasts. So. Oh, yes. It's it's generally my my aim for this podcast was to make it a little bit shorter, a little bit more concise, and to stay on topic. I've completed two of the three objectives. Uh, <laughs> staying on, staying on topic being quite difficult. 
Yeah. But anyway, uh, so again, if you guys want to ask us any questions, because we do want to start a Q&A uh, segment. I mean, we, we have one, but we don't have any questions coming in. So if you guys want to ask anything, leave them in the comment section below of this video on it, YouTube. It, it, or it will get answered. <laughs> yeah, it will get answered, because that's what we do. We aim to please. Or you can leave it in the OceanBees.com forum in the corresponding thread. Uh, you can ask us anything about video games or as long as it's video game related. Uh, so, yeah, just fire away and it will be answered come next podcast, whenever that will be. And like I said, we're trying to do these a little bit more frequently. That's why this one's out uh, before September. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, yep, that should be everything for this episode. So, again... I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Welcome to Bonus Stage. As always, I'm your host, Marauder. And I'm Phoenix 19. And we'll catch you guys in the next one.